Hello again. Kalia's with us again today. Um, so last we heard Alice, remember from our book, Alice is, yeah, Kalia's hair is all over my face. Um, Alice is the girl and she's at this new weird school. They don't call it a school. They call it a learning center. And she found out that the students aren't called students. They are called learners and the teachers are called guides. So they're called that because they don't want the teachers to be above the students and they don't want the students to be below the teachers. Is it's a super weird school and Alice isn't quite sure what she thinks of it, but she is um, wondering what her thing is because everybody at the school seems to have a thing. But she's also realizing that some of the students at the school might be just as weird as she is. Um, but where we left off, Alice thinks she'll be okay staying at the school for a little while. She's basically just waiting until she messes something up and gets sent back home again. So where we left off is we are going back to Millie. Remember Millie is, she calls herself a year is what they call um, the creatures that she is, but she's really like humans or they call them nofers. Humans know them as Bigfoot. So we are going to hear from Millie again. Remember Millie, um, she's kind of naughty. She doesn't listen to her parents and she so badly wants to uh, be she badly wants to be a human and get herself into the human world um so we will see what adventure millie is up to today the morning after the elders meeting the other littlies jacobus and tulip six-year-old matter and four-year-old flory who was already bigger than millie filed into the underground school burrow Millie had been excused for the morning. After first breakfast, she had not nodded solemnly at her father, given her anxious mother a smile, then clambered up the lookout tree. From her perch, she would watch the new school across the lake and do her lessons by herself. And at the snackle, which was served between, between second breakfast and lunch, she'd report to old Aunt Yetta and her father about what she'd seen. She was to count how many nofers there were, how many grown-ups and how many littlies, how many vehicles they had, whether she saw any weapons, and most important, whether the setup on the lakeshore seemed to be permanent or temporary. Old Aunt Yetta had lent her the tribe's single pair of antique binoculars. And Maximus had given her a new notebook and a black felt tip pen. So far, Millie had written her name on the cover with a flourish and made note of the eight cars that had come down the dirt path, as well as the 16 littlies who had gotten out. She was looping the binoculars leather carrying case around her neck and readjusting her position when a furry head popped out of the school burrow door and a voice announced, Keeps the green leaf says it's time for you to come down. Millie sighed. There were only three other littly girls in the Yare tribe. Flory was such a baby that she nibbled on her cheek for when no one was looking, and Matter was almost an elder. Tulip was the only girl close to Millie's age. Tulip was tall and strong and sure-footed. Tulip was always quiet, always good. Last Halloween, she decided to stay home, virtuously announcing that safety was more important to her than candy. Millie and Tulip did not get along. I'm occupied, said Millie. Teacher says now, Tulip said. Nugget, sighed Molly, sighed, sighed Millie. A year expression of regret. It started to scramble down the tree. Tulip's school books were arranged in a neat stack beneath her arm, and her light brown fur, neatly brushed and dressed with a dark blue bow, was already beginning to darken at the tips of her ears. More unfairness, Millie thought. When Millie was born, her birth fur, called Duff, was pure white. No one in the tribe, not even old Aunt Yetta, had knew what it meant, only that it had never happened before. Her parents tried to reassure each other that this was probably normal and that they'd each had or heard of relatives whose light fur had darkened over time. But Millie's fur never became a normal year shade, brown or chestnut or reddish or black, 
Instead, it stayed silvery gray and was not coarse or curly, but was light and sleek as corn silk. Nor did Millie's oddness stop with her strange fur. Most of the air were tall and solid. Millie was short and small. With her thin wrists and delicate fingers, she was the littlest year anyone had ever seen. Although Millie had spoken early, she'd been slow to walk, slow to run, and she'd never been able to keep up with her pack mates. Worse than all of that, though, was the way she pestered her folks about the no fur world and why the year lived the way they did questioning every rule and restriction that the other littlies simply just accepted. I think she's getting comfortable. It must be a good book. Why are we having to be quiet? She had asked when she was three years old, and Teacher Greenleaf had shushed her six times before morning snackle. Because the Nofers will hear us, Teacher Greenleaf lectured, and then do us harm. Why can't I go with you? She asked Maximus each month when her father put on his biggest hat and longest coat and put an empty pack sack over his back. He was preparing for the mailing, a dangerous mission entrusted to the leader of the tribe. The year supported themselves living off the land, sewing their own clothes, eating the food that they'd grown or made. But for as long as Millie had been alive, the year had earned no fur currency by selling things they made in an Etsy shop called Into the Woods. Millie wasn't sure whether Etsy was a person or a place, but she knew how it worked. Each month, the members of the tribe would give Maximus what they made, mittens and caps and bright colors, soft scarves and shrugs and woolen wraps and carved cutting boards and bird houses, special scrubs and decorations made with the herbs and leaves and blossoms the year would grow and gather, all labeled organic and homemade. They'd wrap and package the goods for mailing and then carefully glue on the no fur addresses that old Aunt Yetta had printed weigh each parcel and cover it with the correct number of stamps. Millie loved the night before the mailing. At three, she declared herself the package inspector and would carefully examine each labeled parcel, pasting the nofer names and addresses on her tongue, imagining the different towns and states where the year-made goods would go. The next morning, Maximus would gather up the goods and walk 10 miles to the town of Standish. He'd drop the packages at the posting office counter, all stamped and ready to go. He'd use his key to open up the mailbox and take out whatever goods the year had ordered on the line, white sugar and reading glasses and the snicker bars that all year loved. When Millie was four, she tried to follow her father on the mailing. He caught her, of course, as she'd been punished most severely. Sent to her room every day after lessons were through and then again after dinner. Worse than punishment? Worse than her father's anger was the way her mother had cried until the fur on her face was sodden, holding Millie in a panicky grip and saying over and over that she didn't know what she'd do if she ever lost her little bit. That should have been enough to end Millie's fascination with the no fur world, but it wasn't. Every night, Millie would listen for voices coming from across the lake, the five miles of water that separated the Yer village from the campground where the no furs would come to pitch their tents and light their fires, roast their delicious-smelling meat on sticks, and sometimes sing. Tulip, of course, had no interest in no fur fruits and no fur songs. Tulip was a head taller and much heavier than Millie, but she would probably rusticate first. As soon as her ear tips and the circles around her eyes were completely dark, she'd be an elder, able to hold the speaking stick, a grown-up with a voice and power. Tulip's parents, Millie knew, though their daughter would be a much better ruler than Millie, even though they'd never dare to say so to Maximus. Mill E. Tulip was tapping one large bare foot against the dirt. I am losing patience with you. Wait! Millie's sharp ears had picked up more car sounds. She scrambled up the tree. Across the water, a procession of cars was rolling down the dirt road, stirring up a cloud of dust. She could hear raised voices, slam doors, and the sounds of drums, and someone strumming a guitar, and no furs calling greetings, asking, how was your summer, and saying, good to see you. Millie was so excited that she could barely breathe. She wanted to jump up and down, to wave her arms and shout, I'm here, or go racing across the water. Instead, to calm herself, she sang a lullaby that old Aunt Yetta had taught her. The summer wind came blowing in across the sea, Millie sang softly. She watched a boy 
excuse me, she watched a boy open the back end of a car and lift out a heavy bag and a suitcase. It lingered there to touch her hair and walk with me, she sang. If she ever had the chance to audition for the next stage, she'd sing that song. She could see herself in a silvery dress, the exact color of her silvery fur, clutching the slim stalk of the microphone and closing her eyes as she sang. Except in the daydream, she didn't have fur, but skin. Smooth, lovely skin. Sometimes pinky white, sometimes golden brown, sometimes a radiant black that was almost blue. Human skin. She closed her eyes and listened. There were women singing on the other side of the shore, their voices, and warbling, raised in a wobbly three-part harmony. When John Henry was a little baby sitting on his mama's knee, by the third time through, Millie had the words and the melody, and she joined in, perfectly in tune, when they began the song again. Picked up a hammer in his little right hand, said, Hammer gonna be the death of me, Lord, Lord, hammer gonna be the death of me. Only why would babies own hammer be the death of him? Was there some hammer-related mishap in an upcoming verse? Tulip was glaring at her. If you don't stop with that racket, Teacher Greenleaf will be the death of you. Millie ignored her. I wish, she thought as she stared across the lake, as if wishing could magically transport her over the miles, over the water, to the place where she wanted to be. I wish there weren't deer around it all the time. The elders loved her. She knew, but their love could feel like suffocation, like being crammed into an itchy sweater that had been too small for years. I wish there weren't so many rules. Millie, keep your voice down. Millie, try to keep up with your pack mates. Millie, pay attention. Millie, sit up with straightness. I wish I was having the choice, she thought. I wish I could leave here. I wish I could sing. All right. So that's the end of Millie's part of the story. And we're going to pick up tomorrow with being back at Alice. I think Clea made herself comfortable, so we'll see if she's here for tomorrow's story.